genomics and how we use that to uh, characterize the uh, uh, novel gene functions and then tell you a little bit about metabolomics and uh, where we're going in the future. So you know Florida is a uh, uh, number one state producing uh, oranges, tomatoes. We also produce a lot of fruits like uh, strawberry. But these pathogen insects, you know, that's uh, cause uh, serious disease problems and um, uh, serious loss of these uh, very important uh, economic um, uh, crops. So stomata essentially form by a pair of cells on leaf surface. So these are a pair of what we call the gauze cells. And they open and close. They regulate carbon dioxide intake and water transpiration. And it happens to be the pore, the major entry for bacteria to get into the plant body and uh, in fact the plants. Um, so study how this movement, you know, um, take place. Uh, it's going to be very valuable not only for plant yield, but also for defense. Because pathogens, they're not like uh, fungus. They can penetrate the cell wall. They have to go through these openings. So this is a major opening for pathogen infection. As you can see, uh, bacteria, they can sense, they can find out these openings, and then they get into the plant body through these openings. So they're pretty smart. Uh, essentially, people figure out this is, a, this is a, just about the sugar sensing, the sucrose, uh, so they can attract um, the bacteria to the pore. So it's very interesting if you look at the aperture of that pore, the stomata aperture. Uh, here showing you uh, when plants, when the stomata sense the uh, pathogen signatures, not only the pathogen but the flagellin, we use a flag uh, 22, which is 22 entamino amino acid, which is a single molecule uh, of bacteria. So plants can sense flag 22 or bacteria or liposaccharides. These we call the molecular patterns of bacteria. So they can sense the bacteria, and within one hour, the stomata will close. So that's kind of an innate immunity. But if you look at after like four hours or three hours, um, this is a DC3000, it's Pseudomonas, is a bacteria. So you can see within one hour, stomata close. That's innate immunity. immunity. But uh, after like three or four hours, they will open. The bacteria will secrete a molecule that will trick the stomata to open, then bacteria can get in. So then it causes disease, right? So our goal is to learn this process, how they close, how they open, and what are the molecular switches, um, like our electrical switches, turn on and off the pathway. So before I tell you our progress um, on this, I will show you how we actually study the uh, stomata uh, proteins and metabolites, and how we actually identify the function of glucosinates to be uh, a role in this process. So first of all, you know, we have to isolate the stomata or isolate the cells. So this is just showing you using uh, enzymatic digestion, you can actually release these gas cells and uh, get rid of the uh, Mesocell contamination in the end, you have pretty pure preps of these gas cells. And initially, we actually use this to study, you know, what's the function of proteins and metabolites in these cells in response to pathogen or plant hormones. So the technology we use um, is called ATRAC, as a biotech tag for relative and absolute quantification. Um, so in the beginning, there are four as a biotic tax, as you can see here, there's a reporter. These are all isotopes are made of carbon-13 or nitrogen-15. And then you have a balance groups. So there are four tags. Essentially, the mass tag, like 114, 115, 116, 117, then uh, they have a balance group. So if you have 114, you have 31. If you have 115, you have 30. So essentially, these tags together is the same for all the four tags. It's called as a biotic. So essentially, these tags, they can label the N-terminal amino group. Uh, so you, you do the labeling, you digest protein from four samples, for example, to control and to treatment. Then you label with the different tags. 
and then you mix them together because they are all labeled. Then you do MS. So in MS, the same peptide from all four different samples, they will just show one peak because this is isobaric. The trick is during the collision induced dissociation when you do MS MS. So you select this peptide, collide with the nitrogen, and this bond will break, so they will release the full tax. So if you zoom in the low mass region of the, uh, of the uh, uh, MS MS spectra, you're gonna see the quantity and the mass of these four tags. So the amount of these, the peak area of each of these tags represent how much peptide you have, then the peptide represent how much protein you have in your sample. Um, so this is a, to look at the total protein level changes uh, in the gas cells. So we are also interested in molecular switches, especially redox regulated proteins, like turn on, turn off the activities. Uh, so here we use uh, 2D gel, differential in gel electrophoresis, and also acetobe coated affinity tag to look at this, because these uh, tags, they're really specific for cysteines. So we hypothesize during the pathogen interaction with the gas cells, there are cysteine modifications that serve as redox switches. So how do we capture the cysteines which are responded to pathogen or to hormones? So essentially, in the control conditions, that let's assume all the cysteines are reduced. So when you treat with pathogen or, or these stress hormones, these two get oxidized, okay? So you first accolate the free cysteines using aldocytomide, for example, then here all the cysteines are accolated. And here, because the disulfide bond is formed, there's no accolation. Then you do the reduction, nothing will happen here because this process is irreversible. Then when you do reduction, then this disulfide bond will break. Then you expose this free thiol group, then you can label them with these tags. For example, Dige, you can label control with size three and treatment with size five. And with ACAD, you can label light version of control and heavy version of treatment. So in your 2D gel, all the um, spectra, MS spectra, you're looking for, and the treatment, you have more signal of the heavy or more signal of Psi 5 because that captures what is being oxidized by the pathogen or by plant hormones. So this is a really nice technology, allow you to capture, you know, redox responsive proteins. And the, the um, R-track is more about total protein change. And uh, today we have a workshop, so if you, if you get lost here, we're gonna explain more in the workshop as well. So here showing you the examples of the DIGL, you label control with size three, label treatment with size five. What we're looking for, we're looking for those red spots, where it means, that means, you know, those proteins were oxidized. So we do image analysis and we identify, you know, many, many proteins. So they're redox regulated. Also, we can quantify their uh, total protein level changes. So I'm not gonna go through this list. I'm just uh, gonna highlight some of them. For example, these three isopropylmylate dehydrogenase. So when we do functional classification, this one classified together with the glucosinate metabolism. So what is the glucosinate? Glucosinate is present in plastic vegetables we eat. Uh, so it's, uh, it has a glucose and a, a sulfate group. And this is the oxime with a side chain. This is derived, these molecules, they derive from uh, methionines, uh, phenylalanine, or uh, tryptophan. So essentially, they derive from um, amino acid. So you can see this is a, the, the, the diet gel I showed you. Um, this is a ABA, a plant hormone treatment. So we actually saw increase in the spot of the treated. So this is looking at a cysteine modification. So you quantify three replicates, it's a significant difference. So you cut this spot out, you do mass spectrometry, you discover this is a myrosinase. So what, what is interesting about myrosinase? Myrosinase is essentially hydrolyzed glucosinase I talk about. Glucosinase is very important for plant defense especially in plastic plants. Um, they are also very healthy compounds because a lot of them can help us uh, combat cancers. 
uh, you know, many different kind of cancer. So in Asian countries, we eat a lot of plastic vegetables. People have less likelihood of developing cancer. So what does myrcenase do? Essentially, when insects chewing on the plant leaves, myrcenase will hydrolyze the gluconase, then release these degradation products. So these degradation products, they can deter the generalist uh, insects. So in the meantime, um, our collaborators they use a mutant. This myrcenase mutant, they also found mutant of myrcenase, they actually affect the stomata movement. So previously, people know this gluconoid myrcenase system is involved in defense, but people don't know they play a role, they can play a role in stomata uh, movement. So this is a new discovery using proteomics technologies. So remember that isopropyl manate dehydrogenase, we found it in the redox proteomics. So we actually did some validation work. You know, proteomics or uh, any omics is kind of a large scale discovery. It may not, you know, it may give you false positive, false negatives. So you have to do validation. What we did here, essentially, we um, purify this protein um, uh, in the plants. So this is actually in planta. And you can see we treat it with oxidant, a loss of activity. We uh, treat it with DTT. A, a game, uh, a, a, uh, the activity comes back. And then we look at this uh, oxidized form and reduced form. You can see whenever we have a reduced environment, we have more reduced form, and this reduced form is more active of this enzyme. Um, so this is again treating plants with many different oxidants, uh, like cadmium or, or hydrogen peroxide. You can see whenever you have oxidized conditions, this protein has a more oxidized form. That means a, lo a loss of activity. So what's the function of this isopropyl malate dehydrogenase? As I showed you, it's involved uh, in, uh, in gluconate biosynthesis. So we have genetics. You can see omics combined with genetics. So we can mutate this, this, uh, this gene, and we can put this gene back into the mutant. So you can look at these are the different gluconates. You can look at the gluconate profile. So essentially, whenever you have a mutant, you have very low these aliphatic gluconates derived from methionine. Whenever you put the gene back, you have a recovery of these uh, gluconate. So I'm not going to go into detail. So this is a new discovery of this uh, isopropyl malate dehydrogenase being involved in gluconate metabolism uh, biosynthesis. So you may ask, OK, you discover this from stomata. Does that really affect stomata movement? So we have the mutant. So you can see. Um, the mutant, whenever you treat with uh, ABA, which is a uh, plant hormone, stress hormone, that will close stomata, you can see whenever you have a mutant, the stomata does not close anymore. But a Y type, this is a Y type. You can see Y type, whenever you have this stress hormone, stomata will close. So that indicates this um, uh, enzyme is very important in stomata regulation. So next, we actually develop uh, metabolomics tools to look at the gluconates in the gut cells. Because we discovered gluconate biosynthetic genes, we discovered the myrcenase, which can cleave the gluconates in the gut cells. So are, you know, are there gluconate present in the gut cells? We actually developed these metabolomics technologies using mass spectrometry. We actually can di discover the gluconates levels in the gut cells. They do have gluconates. And then we also use GCMS, we can discover the degradation products of these gluconates. So what we hypothesize is actually these degradation products, they play a signaling role in uh, stomata movement. So we also did a large scale metabolomics uh, comparing the different cell types like gut cells and missile cells. This is a, in response to flight 22, you know, the bacteria signature. So you can see the gas cell response com is, are completely different from the mesocell cell response. So mesocell cells you know, is a major place where carbohydrate is produced, photosynthesis takes place, while gas cells is kind of an entry for the bacteria. So their response is really different. And we have different metabolites. Again, we have uh, very interesting metabolites. So right now we're kind of focusing on identifying, you know, uh, the functions, characterize the functions of these metabolites. A lot of them are, uh, potentially have new functions, 
especially some of the hormones, uh, you know, IAA, I mean, uh, is known to be involved in, in, in stomach movement. So we're doing a lot of functional analysis. And essentially, we want to know the connections and networking in the gut cells so that we can do rationale engineering so we can make plants um, smarter so they can respond to pathogen more effectively. They don't open the stomata you know, after three or four hours so bacteria cannot get in. So this is a collaborative project. Uh, especially, I want to thank the people who have done the work. Some of them already graduated. So the work I showed you um, was uh, mostly done by Dr. Biswa Mishwa, and Tong Zhang is in the audience. And uh, he just graduated, got a PhD, so now he's Dr. Tong Zhang. And then uh, Sisi Gang and Mi Jun and Jin Kong also uh, involved. Okay, so I will just take one minute um, to tell you uh, if you want to do proteomics, we have excellent facility. I'm a director of the facility. We still run 2DGL biomarker discovery, you know, the DIGL I showed you. The iTrack, we run routinely. We run 18 plaques, we run 8 plaques. Now we, we also tested 18 plaques. We run phosphorylation, we run many more modifications, ubiquitination, glycosylation. As you know, you know, we got good machines, we got uh, uh, several these high resolution instruments. Also, uh, we got, uh, I think, seven mass back, and we're purchasing another Orbitrap Fusion, which is really, really powerful. As you know, only machines and uh, will not do the work. You have to have good people. So we have uh, a four PhD scientists uh, in the lab and uh, one chemist, and uh, recently we got a biological scientist. So if you have samples, please send to us, and we're happy to work with you. And I did, I brought some uh, contact information flyers on the first row. So I, you know, if you like to take some, um, I will talk more about workshop in the workshop, about our technologies. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it. The floor is open for discussion. Yeah, I'll Yes. Um, so the DIGE technique, one thing that's always worried me about this technique is that it requires two dye labeling, sometimes you can even more than, than two dyes, right. Psi 3, Psi 5, for example. Right. And it's very sensitive mm -hmm. and it, over, it, it sort of um, deals with the issue of how one gel compared to another gel with anomalous behavior on these gels because so, mm -hmm. they run together. Mm -hmm. But the problem that I see with this technique, and I haven't seen too much about this problem, is that different dyes have different affinities for, this, for different proteins. So, mm -hmm. so you don't get an even distribution of, of a particular dye across the spectrum of proteins in a sample. So when you mix, you know, 50% of the sample is Psi 3 right. labeled, Right, fifty percent aside, five labeled from a treatment. Right, when you mix, and you see a difference mm -hmm. when you measure the two wavelengths. How do you deal with the problem that you have differential dye binding from for different samples from, from, from yep. different different proteins within the same sample? Right, that's an excellent question. Uh, that's more um, obvious. I mean, uh, when you do the the minimal labeling, mm -hmm. you know, you only label 5% and you label the license, right. um, you know, that could, you know, potentially have problems, size 3, size 5. What people have been doing is they do dye swapping. Right. Right. So they swap, they do size 3, size 5, then they swap it. So the dye we're using here is a, called a saturation dye. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we use a lot of you know, the labels is, you know, um, more than enough labels. And it's label systems, not a license. So I think this one is definitely a lot more reproducible because you label all the systems. You denature the protein before you label it. And then you expose the systems, then you capture it using the size. You, you have less systems than you would lysines. Right, you have less systems, but as you mentioned, this dye is so sensitive. The gel I showed you, mm -hmm. uh, we only used 2.5 microgram of protein. Mm -hmm. 
So when you when you swap the dyes, you find that the changes are reproducible. Um, we didn't swap the dyes with this one mm -hmm. because you know the saturation dyes is all saturated. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't expect the labeling efficiency difference between size three and size five. I do I do see quite a, a bit of differences in the efficiency between size three and size five. But the other thing is that you you mean uh, you mean the uh, unsaturated right yeah the minimum well, you try dye. to saturate but these dyes aren't cheap when you start right. to right. I think the other thing too is that um, when you're when you're really saturating you hopefully you, you saturate the system but right. nevertheless it's not really clear it will not be hundred percent yeah Tom did some work and we actually measure the free styles but we got like. Um, 90, more than 90, 96% or something like that. Yeah, that's probably the best way. Yeah, but, but as you mentioned, these dyes are not yeah, cheap, right? Word, it, yeah. it's, there's a whole type of protein purification technology that's all based on dye ligand chromatography. You really can see yeah. huge differences between proteins and their affinity for the same dye. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.